Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, wow, I like that. This is, this is going to be a great, great conference. Uh, my name is Walter Roberts. I am a board member at NHD. And on behalf of the board and the staff, I want to welcome you all to our conference today. I think you'll enjoy and learn quite a bit from us. We're all housing geeks, obviously, right? So this will be an exciting, exciting uh, conference. Um, just, just for me, because I'm out of sorts right now, it's just, has it been raining all week? Is it just, it's just, ah, oh, but I really appreciate you guys coming through today. Um, I'm told to be very brief, five minutes, so that we can go on with the rest of the program. I'm really excited to hear from our keynote speakers and all of their practitioners that will be speaking throughout the day, uh, all of which was put together by a very talented staff uh, uh, ANHD, about 12 folks, 12 to 15 folks who work really, really hard on behalf of the 101 member organizations of ANHD. So I'd like to, uh, one, uh, commend Benjamin and his staff for putting together this, this great conference, and maybe we should give him a round of applause for that work. Thank you. Uh, I, I did go back and look in your, in, obviously in your handouts to give you more detail about what NHD is, but I did go back and look to see, started in 1974, and I was trying to think about the things that were going on in 1974, so uh, let me think, there was, um, I, started, I started high school, okay, that was one. Uh, there was, there was uh, this uh, amendment to the, um, the Housing and Community Development Act to create Section 8. And then there was this controversy about the President of the United States. Uh, what do you think made the headlines? So housing is something that's always been there. It winds up underneath the radar in some cases. It is an important topic. It is something that we all obviously know and want to learn more about. And through the conferences, I mean, the um, little panels today, hopefully you'll learn that much more. Uh, I, I won't promise it'll be like a Law & Order episode where you, you know, at the end we'll have the answer to everything. But I think it will pique your interest and we can continue the conversations in future uh, conferences. Uh, so for, for those of us who um, are familiar with the work of boards, you know it's, a, it's a, you know, an honor to be on, a, on an organization or with an organization. Uh, it's tireless work. We have a great staff here in H NHD, um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that you get the reward when you're able to speak to an audience like this. Uh, I would like to, I didn't see all of the board members, but in, rather than be embarrassed and call out names and not see them, if they maybe just stand up so we can recognize them as well. Okay, great. So these are folks that all have daytime jobs, and they also make an extra effort to contribute to the organization, and we want to thank them for their good and hard work. So to that, I, I guess we'll continue on with the, the rest of the day, but I wanted to, again, thank you all for joining us here at, uh, at our conference, and hopefully the takeaway will be something that will continue to grow and build for future work that we have to do here in the great city of New York. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Barika Williams. I'm the deputy director here at ANHD. And on behalf of ANHD and the staff, many of whom are in the back, um, welcome um, to yet another year. This is always such a great event. Um, so I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of polling. Uh. So if everyone can look to the screen over here, um, if you can pull out your phones, we're going to use this texting app um, to sort of get us going, because this is a community development conference. And we like to bring our energy and our enthusiasm and our commitment and our dedication to this work as a part of kicking off the day. So we ready? All right, so we're going to do a tester question first. Oh, uh, Melanie, can we go back a couple? So you're going to open the texting app to 22. Two, so that, um, you open the texting app, it's to 22, two, text 2233. Two, Everybody got that? Can those folks over here? And then you're going to type in A N H D N Y C. 
hit send, and you're ready to go. So you want to text 22333, hit send, then type ANHDNYC, hit send again, and then we're all good to go. Pause still, more pauses, keep going. How are we doing? Good to go. I see thumbs up over there. Awesome. I see thumbs up here. You guys over here good? One second. I see a one second. Everyone good? It won't send you, you won't say, it won't, you won't have something back. We're going to just, you're going to text your answer. Okay, so, oh, we have, folks have already started. Okay, so, what borough are you here repping? Who are you here to represent in terms of boroughs? A, Manhattan. B, the Bronx. C, Brooklyn. D, Queens. E, Staten Island. Those are your options. A, Manhattan. B, the Bronx. C, Brooklyn, D, Queens, E, Staten Island. All right. Okay, so we got Staten Island at 3%. Some Staten Islanders here. We make noise here, guys. Come on. You're supposed to be repping your borough. Looks like Queens is creeping up at 17, 20%. Do we have Queens here? Can I hear from my Queens folks? There we go. All right. We've got, ooh, close tie coming in. Manhattan looks like we're coming in at 23%, 22%. Manhattan? Manhattan here? No, Manhattan's kind of quiet. <laughs> now I know this one's not going to be. So we've got at 24%, we've got the Bronx in the house. Yeah, see? Bronx doesn't mess around on making noise. And coming in super strong at 33%, my home borough, Brooklyn. Brooklyn's in the house. All right. Okay. There we go. We got to get our, we know it's the morning. You got to get your blood flowing. Okay. So we're going to kick off with some, this is your tester question. We're going to kick off with some questions to get us all thinking, get us in, all in the right mode before we bring up for a conversation. Okay. So next question. Which of the following are now included in the legal definition of tenant harassment in New York City. Okay, so we've got five, four options. Which of the following are now included in the legal definition of tenant harassment in New York City? Option A, misrepresenting an apartment's rent stabilization status. A, misrepresenting an apartment's rent stabilization status. Option B, repeated failures to correct hazardous violations. Right? Repeated failures to correct hazardous violations. Option C, requesting documentation of citizenship status. Option C, requesting documentation of citizenship status. And option D, all of the above. Everybody in? Okay, so clearly we are a very in tune audience because the correct answer is option D, all of the above. Um, so, and this, these option A, B, and C are all things that were added to the definition of tenant harassment as a part of the recent campaign and win um, of certificate of no harassment. So these are all new things that have been added to the definition of tenant harassment in the past six months. Okay, next question. What is the New York City commercial vacancy rate? So commercial, A, 1%. B, 14%, C, 27%, D, none of the above, okay? What is the commercial vacancy rate? A, 1%, B, 14%, C, 27%, D, none of the above. I can see the faces. People are like, wait a second, hold on, I got to think. All right. Got it, got it. Okay. So, we got a few A's, about 65% of folks think that it's B at 
27% of folks think that it's C. 27, 28 think of it's C at 27%, and we've got eight or nine percent down at D. The correct answer is D, none of the above, and the reason is there is no citywide vacancy rate. We do not track commercial vacancies as a city, and so we actually don't have any accurate information on this ever at any given point in time. Things to think about, you'll hear about that throughout the day. All right, next one. Now we're on to opinions. Get us all thinking, right? We're warmed up for the morning. Okay. When it comes to zoning, what do you think is the best way to preserve and build affordable housing in your community? This is your opinion. There is no right answer. What is, when it comes to zoning, what do you think is the best way to preserve and build affordable housing in your community? Option A, upzone with MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing. So upzone requirement to include affordable housing and part of it. Option B, upzone with mandatory inclusionary housing and strong anti-displacement protections. So you're going to upzone, take a slice for affordable housing, and have anti-displacement protections. Option C, only upzone for mission-driven development. We have many of those folks in the room, so only upzoning for um, mission-driven developers. And option D, downzone, decrease density and decrease some of that pressure. Opinions. This is what you think, how you feeling, how are folks feeling? All right. Okay, so we've got almost nobody for upzone with just MIH. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty unanimous crowd on that one. Vast majority of people right now, 64%, are thinking upzone with MIH and strong anti-displacement. We've got some folks who really like the idea of upzone only for mission-driven developers. That's at about 33%. And we've got, eh, I can't tell what percent that is, but can I do the math quickly enough? Probably 5 6% who are down at D, um, down zone only. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of where people are thinking as we go into these conversations. All right, and last question. All right, and this is thinking about who's in the room, so we also understand who else is going to be a part of this day with us. How do you, in your work, in your life, um, both either in your job or personally, how do you build community power? Option A, with grassroots organizing. Option B, with media and communications. Option C, with policy and research. Option D, with lending and financing. And option E, with preservation and development. So A, grassroots organizing. B, media and communications. C, policy and research. D, lending and financing. E, preservation and development. All right. Okay, so we've got about 8% who are talking media and communications. We've got a lot of folks like that in the room. We've got some media here. We've got about 15% with policy and research. Us policy wonks, yay. That's me, okay. Um, we've got about 18% with lending and financing. We've got our bank regulators, folks who do housing counseling in the room. Um, 22% preservation and development, right? And then coming in strong, 35% who are doing building community power with grassroots organizing. Yep. All right. So that's who's here. That's who's in the room. That'll give us all a little chance to start. And we're going to bring up um, Benjamin Dulcin now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody for being here for this important conversation. Um, as you guys know, I think we know we have a lot of folks who come to the ANHD conference every year. Um, what is sort of unique and unusual about the ANHD conference is that it really brings together all the different elements of the community development sector in New York City that need to be around the table, that need to be in sometime tense but always constructive conversation to help to build more justice and more equity in New York City. So the ANHD membership of 101 neighborhood-based not-for-profit affordable housing and economic, equitable economic development organizations, our partners uh, in, the, in the financial sector, uh, the fun partners in the regulatory sector, decision makers in government sector, and other policy experts from around New York City. 
Um, New York City really is just a remarkable example of the success of the idea of community development. And as we'll hear more about in a little bit, the idea of the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, a and HD has been around since 1974. We were founded by, I think, seven uh, neighborhood-based uh, CDCs back in 1974 who came together with this idea that there was a really powerful way to do community development by combining cutting edge development skills, really being able to build bricks and mortar housing with the best of them by bringing in local services to really help to strengthen and support the, the uh, distressed social infrastructure of the neighborhood, but combining that consistently with the idea of an activist movement that wasn't just accepting the tools that government was giving them, wasn't just accepting the, well, what, what was, you know, the, 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 the reality that government was saying or the limitations of their neighborhoods, but was constantly mobilizing the neighborhood, doing grassroots organizing to effectively change the landscape so that it was local community voices that were defining what their issues were and were constantly demanding more, demanding greater impact from their leaders in government and from their partners in the financial sector. Um, as a result of that, New York City, and you know, we're all sort of still, uh, you know, sort of still, um, you know, constantly pushing harder, constantly sort of struggling with the very serious issues that we're facing today. But it's important to take a moment to recognize just how effective the efforts of the community development sector and our partners have been in New York City over the years. So over the last 35 years, New York City has built or preserved with city-backed financing about. 380,000 units of affordable housing and has genuinely revitalized, physically and socially revitalized, tens of severely distressed neighborhoods around the city. Um, this isn't to, you know, to, to, to underestimate or to underemphasize any of the really critical issues that we're facing now. New York City is a hot market, and yet our population remains uh, you know, heavily divided between high income and very, very low income, who are really you know, sort of pushed to the margins. We'll be talking a lot about those displacement issues and those displacement pressures throughout the day. But the idea that New York City government not only must be an effective force for shaping the housing market, for not only using the tools that it has, but creating new tools that can respond to a, a citizen demand for greater affordability, for greater stability. That is a powerful thing. And I think more than any uh, municipal government in the country, New York City government really sort of steps up and knows that it has to respond to that community demand. And so it's constantly trying to create new tools, both for affordable housing production, and again, the production uh, numbers are, are remarkable for New York City, but also for preservation um, and for anti-displacement pressure. And it's notable how hard community development organizations and community activists pushed over the last couple of years for new and stronger anti-displacement pre uh, protections for tenants, but then also how our government responded to that and passed a number of important new program uh, 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 policies into law over the last year. We'll be talking more about that throughout the day. But again, what it comes down to is this remarkable um, uh, partnership between developers with sort of the, you know, the, the sort of the really sharp skills to actually deliver effective services, um, organizers and activists who are constantly sort of pushing the demand, and partners in the financial sector and uh, in, in government. Because for every, you know, for, the, for those 380,000 units of affordable housing that were built or preserved, every single one of those units of housing had low cost, bank uh, uh, financial sector financing as an essential part of the capital stack that allowed that unit to be built that would not that that housing would not have been built without our partners in the financial sector and our partners in the financial sector wouldn't have been there with us or at least would have been there with far fewer resources were it not for the context of the community reinvestment act um, so that brings us to our, our keynote speaker um, we're at a really essential moment right now of, um, uh, of in the life of the Community Reinvestment Act, where the act has been in place for a number of years. There's been a long, you know, long conversation about what can and should make it stronger. We're now beginning a CRA modernization process where the federal agencies have begun to talk about and sort of put out papers that express um, their opinions on how CRA regulations and rules should be modernized and made more effective. Um, the details of that make all the difference in the world. Um, what makes the CRA work 
there are a lot of things that make the CRA work, but one of the things that is absolutely essential is that it is locally focused on local credit needs, that it's not just sort of a, you know, a, a checkbook taken out and signed. It's not just a sort of off-the-shelf wholesale effort, but that it's financial institutions, when they do their reinvestment well, they are looking in detail at what are the local credit needs and how they can think in a creative and effective way about how to meet those local credit needs and how to respond in a, 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 in a robust and creative way to local, to, to local reinvestment needs. That's what distinguishes, you know, Good dollars, but not nearly as effective from really effective, high-impact reinvestment effort that can revitalize a neighborhood. Um, we are fortunate to have a lot of that in New York City, a lot of good partners at the table on that, and it really is the effectiveness of the CRA that allows that to happen. We're now in a moment where, people, where the regulators are considering reforming the CRA and making sure that the regulators are focusing on keeping that local community context, focusing on bank branches that even in sort of a modernizing uh, you know, technological environment, bank branches still matter immensely as we'll be talking about later in the day. And so having that uh, conversation well led um, so that all the regulators are really understanding what does and doesn't work about the CRA will be essential. Um, so we are very pleased this morning uh, to have uh, Dr. Lyle Brainerd with us. Um, Dr. Brainerd is the, um, a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System since 2014. Um, she uh, is a member of the Board of Governors uh, who uh, is, gives primary consideration to issues of community development, and so she's a very important voice in all of these issues. Um, prior to her appointment to the Board of Governors, uh, she served uh, as Undersecretary of the U.S. Treasury from 2010 to 2013, and a counselor to the, uh, uh, was Counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury uh, in 2009. Uh, before that, she was a founding director uh, of the Global Economy and Development Project at the Brookings Institute uh, and a deputy national economic advisor to President Clinton. She has a PhD in economics from Harvard University, uh, and we are tremendously honored uh, to have her with us here today. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Benjamin uh, Dolchin for that very kind introduction and uh, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development for the invitation to be with you here today. While New York is known globally as a cultural hub that attracts the world to its doorstep, it is known locally as a city of neighborhoods. And like other cities all across America, New York's future is bound to the vitality of its neighborhoods as places to live and work, learn and play, worship and invest. I know neighborhoods have been the focus of this organization's work for over 40 years, and that your member's success is a function of your unwavering focus on preserving and strengthening the quality of life and vitality of low and moderate income neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Like many of the nation's metropolitan areas, New York has rebounded since the recession and is thriving. That, however, has not been the experience of too many of its residents. Many of your residents haven't fully recovered and some have fallen further behind. Here, as elsewhere in the country, there remain very important gaps in economic opportunity. We now know from powerful research that persistent gaps in opportunity are connected to the health of neighborhoods. The effects of place on opportunity stretch from one generation to the next. Raj Shetty and others have shown that upward mobility varies immensely by neighborhood, even within the same metropolitan area. The longer a child lives in a neighborhood of opportunity, a neighborhood that is racially and economically integrated with strong families, social capital, and schools, the more likely that child will do better than their parents economically in adulthood and navigate a path of upward mobility. These neighborhood disparities therefore matter for growth and prosperity nationally. If there are large disparities in opportunity such that the enterprise exertion and investments reap lower returns in some communities than others, then families and small businesses in those communities will invest less in their futures and potential growth will fall short. Although there are important implications at the national level, to the extent that the roots of those disparities 
lie in local communities, the important part of the solution is likely to be investments in those communities. And that brings me to the Community Reinvestment Act. That one powerful insight, the importance of investment in our communities lies at the heart of the Community Reinvestment Act. The CRA is one of the principal tools that Congress has provided for improving investment and development in lower income communities. Implementing this law effectively is one of the important responsibilities we have in promoting strong outcomes locally that reverberate nationally. So let me turn to the role of the CRA in supporting local efforts to strengthen low and moderate income neighborhoods and offer my preliminary thoughts on the opportunity before us to make the regulations even more effective. The CRA was enacted in 1977 to combat the legacy of redlining, the demarcation in red ink of neighborhoods deemed too risky for lending. Federal agencies use these redlined maps in deciding where not to guarantee mortgage loans, and the resulting deprivation of credit stifled opportunity for the people in those neighborhoods. Through the CRA, Congress requires the federal banking agencies to encourage banks and thrifts to help meet the credit needs of the communities they are charted to serve, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. It requires the Federal Reserve and our other peer agencies to evaluate how well banking institutions help meet those needs and to assign ratings to their performance. It requires us to make public both the ratings and our written evaluations of performance. That transparency is important. It provides an incentive for banks to work with their communities to meet the needs of their low and moderate income members, and it provides important information to enable community members to engage more meaningfully with banks. The CRA is unique in that regard. It puts decision making about the community's needs and priorities in the hands of local stakeholders. Financial institutions that lend and invest, community organizations that deliver services and develop real estate and help communities articulate their needs, and state and local governments that direct incentives and subsidies. The enactment of other laws around the same time was also vital to the CRA's success, including the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which requires lenders to report the location of their home mortgage lending and the race and income of borrowers, which is a key source of data in this arena. Of course, much has changed in the years since the CRA was enacted. Because CRA is such a vital tool to address the credit needs of low and moderate income communities, I believe the time is ripe for a refresh to make it even more relevant to today's circumstances. So we're undertaking discussions with the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, with which we have traditionally issued joint rulemakings on the CRA. There are five principles uh, that can help guide these efforts. First, we should update the area in which the agencies assess a bank's CRA activities while retaining the core focus on place. This is the most important aspect of refreshing the CRA and also the one that will require the most care. As the bank members of our Federal Advisory Council have noted, and I'm just quoting them here, a bank's ability to engage in meaningful community development efforts continues to require meaningful knowledge of and presence in local communities. So a significant strength of CRA evaluations is that a bank's performance is evaluated taking into account the demographics of its communities, the types of housing and businesses they serve, and the other financial institutions serving those communities. The current regulations use branches and deposit-taking ATMs as a proxy for the communities the bank serves because those were the primary mechanisms for delivering services when the CRA was enacted and for many years following that. It reflected initially an environment where interstate banking was not allowed and physical branches were necessary for deposit taking and lending. Today, changes in technology and consumer preferences have made it possible for banks to serve customers far beyond those physical branches and ATMs via online and mobile platforms. 
But even so, as much as technology has made banking transactions more convenient for customers, it hasn't eliminated the importance of branches. For large parts of the country, branches and deposit-taking ATMs remain an important way that banks engage with their community. Branches and ATMs are still necessary for depositing and withdrawing cash. Branches provide personal service and assistance to consumers and business customers. They provide a presence for lenders to get to know borrowers and the communities in which they live, lend, and invest. And as the members of our Community Advisory Council, which Benjamin was a founding member, recently emphasized, and I'm quoting here, for many rural and low and moderate income populations, bank branches remain critical. Recent studies measuring the impact of branch closures on credit availability demonstrate that fact that branches still matter, particularly with respect to accessing small business credit. My colleagues here at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York have found that access to small business credit declines and the rates on small business loans increase the farther is the borrower from a branch. Similarly, they find the large majority of mortgage lending continues to be located in one or more of a bank's delineated assessment areas, that is, near physical branches. This research also finds that people in low-income census tracts were more than twice as likely to live in a banking desert, an area without a branch within 10 miles, than those in higher-income tracts. When they're cut off from mainstream banking institutions, not surprisingly, some of these consumers rely on more expensive alternatives, such as payday, auto title loans, pawn shops, and check cashing services. Now, we recognize that banks vary widely in terms of the types of services they offer and the mechanisms they use for reaching their customers. On one end of the spectrum, many community banks still rely primarily on branches and ATMs, with mobile functionality offered primarily to enhance the customer experience. In the middle of the spectrum, regional and national banking organizations are using online and mobile app capabilities to attract and retain customers well beyond their physical footprint. And at the other end of the spectrum, online banks employ business models that reach customers across much or all of America without relying on branches. Although those online banks may provide the same products and services as a traditional bank, because they have only one location, they're evaluated for CRA purposes in the area around that location. Still other banks offer a limited set of credit products or wholesale services. Take, for example, the industrial loan companies, the ILCs, which have CRA obligations as state chartered depositories. Many large ILCs happen to be chartered in Utah, and they're evaluated on their CRA performance in Salt Lake City. Even though they lend nationally, the result is a saturated market for community development lending and investments in Salt Lake City. At the same time, other areas in Utah and beyond have important community development needs that go unmet. At a minimum, revised CRA regulation should allow those kinds of banks to expand CRA activities beyond the area surrounding its branch so that the, com the community and economic development needs of more underserved communities can be met. In considering ways to revise the CRA regulations, the agencies are going to need to be thoughtful about how to make those areas in which we evaluate CRA performance more meaningful both to banks and to low and moderate income communities. For community banks that rely on branches, the current assessment area approach is likely to need only small adjustments. For banks that serve their customers through a variety of approaches, assessing their broader deposit taking and loan making footprint might make some sense. For large wholesale banks, it might make sense to evaluate CRA activity in a broader area and to encourage them to direct more of their investments and services to underserved areas. So that brings me to the second and related principle, which is that the regulation should encourage banks to seek out opportunities in underserved areas. As I noted earlier, we see the CRA as recognizing banks make a unique contribution. 
Banks are uniquely able to make targeted and high impact investments because of their stake in their local communities. They're long term stakeholders so that their efforts to finance housing, small business and community services aren't just good business short term, but they're also good investments long term as the residents improve their economic standing and are able to use more of those banking services. Streamlining the CRA regulations and clarifying the performance measures could create stronger incentives for banks to pursue the less obvious but potentially higher impact projects that low and moderate income neighborhoods need the most to become areas of opportunity. So we'll want to update the CRA in ways that reduce the distortions that lead to some areas becoming credit hotspots and others credit deserts. Where there's a high density of banks relative to investment opportunities, the result may be declining returns on those CRA investments. Meanwhile, other areas may have a difficult time attracting capital, not because the social return is low, but rather because they are not located in the bank's major market. However we define a bank's assessment area, we need to do so in a way that encourages banks to direct their community investment activity to the areas with the highest social returns. The third guiding principle is that the CRA regulations should be tailored to different sizes as well as business models. We have to set standards that are flexible enough to uh, include the CRA performance of a $100 million bank, no less than a $2 trillion bank. Banks, for their part, seek clearer, simpler rules that result in more CRA activity with less burden. We believe this can be done while retaining the flexibility to evaluate performance in light of the community's demographics, economic conditions, and credit needs and opportunities. Regulatory revisions that don't contemplate evaluating CRA performance in context could arguably undermine the CRA's greatest value, its recognition that banks are uniquely situated to be responsive to the most important community and economic development needs in their communities. The typical small community bank focuses on serving its community through deposit and credit products and may not have the capacity to finance a major community development initiative. But as banks grow in size or specialize in different types of lending, they may well have greater capacity to invest through additional channels. We want to be sensitive to the ways in which banks' business models, in addition to its size, influence the type of activities it can best undertake. We we'll want to maintain the flexibility to ensure no matter the business line, a bank can meet its obligations by doing what it has the expertise to do best. And as we look to improve our evaluations, the agencies are going to need to determine what kind of data will be necessary to evaluate a bank's CRA performance based on the activities that it chooses and which banks should collect and report that data based on their scale and business model. The fourth principle is the revised regulation should promote greater consistency and predictability in evaluations and, and ratings both within and across agencies. The members of our Federal Advisory Council have recommended the regulations need to be consistent across the agencies and provide for all regulated financial institutions to be subject to the same CRA crediting, examination and remedial standards. We agree. Banks have expressed understandable concern regarding the variation they see in evaluations. They seek greater clarity in advance about what activities will qualify. They want to understand how the qualitative criteria, those measuring the impact and responsiveness of loans, investments, and services, will be factored into their ratings. This concern isn't limited to banks. The community organizations and local governments that are trying to attract that bank financing to their projects also need this clarity. Regulatory streamlining can also help, and regular, examining, regular examiner training is crucial. Finally, the fifth principle is to ensure that revised CRA regulations support its position as one of several mutually reinforcing laws designed to promote an inclusive financial services industry. The central thrust of the CRA is to encourage banks to ensure that all creditworthy borrowers have fair access to credit.
For banks to be successful in meeting the credit needs of their entire community, it follows they must guard against discriminatory or unfair and deceptive lending practices. Ensuring fair access to credit is difficult and requires ongoing vigilance. For this reason, taking a holistic view of closely related issues is likely to be the best way to fulfill the purpose of the CRA as one of several important laws intended to promote fair financial access. I want to briefly connect the dots between the high priority we put on strengthening the CRA and the pressing challenge of affordable housing that is a key focus of the work that so many of you here today do. Housing connects families concretely to place and can be a source of strength or fragility. Pew just released a study showing 38% of renting households in America are spending more than 30% of their pre-tax income on rent. That's a 20%, nearly 20% increase from 2001. The percentage of renter households that are spending half or more of their income on housing increased by over 40% during that period. As you all know, rent-burdened households often find themselves unable to pursue proven strategies to achieve financial security and invest in their family's future. They may need to turn to costly short-term sources of credit to cover emergency expenses. Some may experience eviction if there's an unexpected expense or loss of income. They may need to live far from where they work to afford housing, rent substandard units, or resort to overcrowding. As a society, we need to do better in ensuring that affordable housing is available where it's needed. The supply of affordable housing is a good example of a problem of national scope whose solution has to be tailored to local needs and conditions. This audience knows better than most about the complex dynamics that affect housing locally. Local decisions on zoning, taxes, and leveraging of federal funding, and whether community needs are prioritized are at the heart of whether neighborhoods thrive. I'm not going to suggest there are any easy answers to this issue, but the CRA is one of the important policy levers that can make a difference. It does this by encouraging banks to provide affordable and sustainable mortgage products to qualified low and moderate income families. That helps those families have a chance to purchase homes sustainably and build equity. In addition, by encouraging banks to work with the community to identify tailored rental and home ownership investment opportunities, the CRA helps encourage the construction of affordable housing where it's needed most. In our efforts to refresh the CRA regulations, we'll continue to honor the purpose of the law by encouraging banks to engage in local community and economic development initiatives. I'm confident there are ways to update the areas where we evaluate performance without losing the core focus on place. We should do more to encourage banks to offer deposit and credit products designed to help rent burden customers save for home ownership and build strong credit scores that will enable them to succeed in obtaining sustainable mortgage credit. We should do more to encourage banks to lend to the underserved entrepreneurs and small businesses that hold the promise of providing jobs and growing local economies. Even as the economy looks strong overall, significant challenges remain for low and moderate income areas, making the CRA and its focus on local credit needs more important than ever. I look forward to hearing from many of you over the next several months to help inform our interagency efforts to refresh those regulations. This conference is an opportunity for all of you to envision the future for New York's neighborhoods and discuss critical actions to achieve your vision. I know you have a full agenda today replete with pressing conversations on the compelling challenges that face your neighborhoods. I want to applaud your work to ensure that all of neighbor, New York's neighborhoods are communities of opportunity. Thank you very much. So I believe we have time for a few questions and uh, I think there's somebody with a microphone if anybody's uh, got a question or two. So just raise your hand. Or not. <laughs> All right, so with that, 
Thank you very much. I wish you uh, a very productive day, and, and it's really a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Brainerd. Um, those were, uh, if those are the, if that is the spirit, and if those are the, uh, the thoughts that uh, that guide the CRA modernization process, it will be a it will be a good and successful process. We appreciate all of that, all of that really thoughtful detail. Um, uh, uh, just a, a couple of quick things um, before we go to the uh, the champion uh, of affordable housing award. Just I want to give just a big uh, uh, shout out to the ANHD board members uh, who guide our organization. Um, ANHD board, we are led by senior staff of our member organizations uh, who work really hard with us to make sure that ANHD is, is doing work every day that is deeply in line with what our organizations and our movement need. So thank you to the board members and particularly and particularly today, I uh, just want to say a big thank you to the, the staff of ANHD. Um, ANHD has a small staff and we... Um, the, the, the ANHC and our staff punches above our weight every day, but I think we really punch above our weight uh uh, you know, on, on this conference day, and that happens because all the ANHD staff just you know chips in their efforts throughout the you know throughout the year to to plan and to make the, this conference come together. Can I just ask the ANHD staff to stand up. Most of the ANHD staff is already standing, is already working so hard. And then just uh, particularly today uh, to uh, Melanie Brialta and to Lauren Nye, who have really done uh, so much of the, the, the key coordination of this. Um, and so with that, I'm going to bring up uh, uh, Chris Cirillo, a member of our board of directors, uh, to present the uh, Champion of Affordable Housing Award. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a large turnout. Um, uh, when Benjamin asked the ANHD board members who wanted to come up and do the introduction for this award, I jumped up the, at the opportunity. I have known Eric Enderlin uh, for close to 20 years now, both through the work that we've both done uh, in a variety of different roles, uh, but also personally, and so the opportunity to come up here and spend a couple of minutes telling you about why he is so deserving of this award is a great uh, privilege for me. Um, Eric really embodies the spirit of the work that all of us try to do every day in the neighborhoods that we serve. Um, whether it's in his current job as the president of the city's housing development corporation where he is responsible for financing thousands of units of housing every year, preserving and creating homes for people who need them desperately in this city, um, or his time spent at HPD in a variety of roles, including as deputy commissioner for development, um, and not mentioned in his bio, but his time before that at the city's housing authority. Um, Eric has seen the housing issues that the city faces, um, that our, our um, communities face in all different perspectives, and um, has brought to his work, whether at NYCHA or HPD or HDC, uh, uh, a sense of caring and commitment to uh, all of the things that we all value to deep affordability, to serving the people who most desperately need affordable housing, to permanent affordability, recognizing that we can't keep creating housing that will expire at some point, that we need to keep people in their homes and prevent them from being displaced from the communities and the homes that they love. And especially for those of us who do development work at nonprofits, to, to mission-driven development, to the fact that it's not just about building units, it's about creating homes, it's about strengthening communities, um, and it's about the people who live and work and build their families and um, just help to really create the city that we are, this beautiful collection of neighborhoods. And so 
Um, it's a great honor on behalf of ANHD to announce Eric Enderlin as our 2018 Champion of Affordable Housing, and it's my great privilege to invite up Maria Torres Springer, the Commissioner of the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, to help present the award. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, and really to the board and to um, the staff. This is not mine. Um, to the, the staff, um, the incredible staff and the board of NHD for the opportunity to present the Champion of Housing Award to my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Eric Enderlin. I really could not imagine a better partner than Eric to advance our very ambitious and really urgently needed affordable housing, goal, housing goals. It was his birthday a couple of days ago, so I texted him, all caps, happy birthday. Um, but the, the next thing that I texted him is, um, I really um, am so lucky every day to call him as a partner um, in the work that we do. Um, as mentioned, he has spent almost his entire career in affordable housing, much of it in public service for the city of New York, first at NYCHA, as was mentioned, then at HPD, now, of course, at the helm of the New York City Housing Development Corporation. He's really been instrumental in strengthening and fine-tuning the affordable housing engine that drives so much of what we do. A true houser, in so many ways, Eric embodies for me what is best about the affordable housing community. Let me name the reasons why. First, he is guided by a profound sense of mission, always looking to achieve deeper affordability, more lasting affordability, and to make sure that our investment in affordable housing does double duty in terms of opportunities for both people and places. At the same time, he's deeply committed to honing the craft. So he's always pushing the envelope to achieve all of these goals as efficiently and as effectively as possible, while also trying to raise the bar in terms of the programs and the policies that we set in place. Second, Eric is the consummate team player in what is truly the ultimate team sport. He appreciates the deep bench of talent in the affordable housing community and values the unique contributions of every team player. He's keenly focused as well on expanding that bench, strengthening the tools available to the many not-for-profit developers who are the backbone of so much of our affordable housing work, forging ties with faith-based organizations and MWBEs, looking to establish a foothold in the community, and partnering with our many colleagues across government agencies who share our commitment to making sure stable, affordable homes are within reach of more and more New Yorkers. Third, he never loses sight of the forest for the trees. As so many of you in this room here know, the work of creating and preserving affordable housing can be enormously complicated. It layers together so many different programs and tools from a wide variety of sources that at times it can feel like a little bit of an ab um, alphabet soup of acronyms. This work can get um, very quickly, very weedy, and very jargony, but no matter how deep in the details you wade, Eric can follow you, but he can also lead you back out to keep the big picture in sight. He is driven, to be sure as we all are, by a profound sense of urgency in trying to address the very real needs we see on the ground. But he also sees, and perhaps it's the teacher in him, the long arc of history and has his eye trained on the policies and precedents we leave for the next generation of practitioners and policymakers. Because indeed all of us are motivated by the need to give as many individuals and families as possible the opportunities that they need to thrive in the city today. But we're also trying to lay the foundation for the kind of city that we want to be far into the future. 
Now more than ever, when all of the programs we rely on to do this work seem to be under attack, we need the kinds of housers, the kinds of champions, like Eric, to solve the very real, very complex problems that we face. His optimism, his boundless sense of what is possible, it is, in my opinion, the perfect foil for what ails us in this current political moment. It's a reminder that there is always a path forward as we seek holistic, long-lasting solutions to ensure the continued strength of our city. And so it is really with great honor to present this very, very, very well-deserved award to our colleague and friend and the tireless champion of affordable housing, Eric Enderlin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. So many um, familiar faces over the years, I'm talking about the years. Um, thank you, Maria, for that incredible introduction. Um, and also for your remarkable leadership, your partnership, and your commitment to improving the lives of New Yorkers. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone here from ANHD f you know, for this honor, but more for the important work you do to support low-income New Yorkers and to strengthen the collective efforts of nonprofit organizations and New York City neighborhoods. Organizations like ANHD and its extensive membership understand the needs of our communities best. Your work is critical to ensuring more diverse and resilient neighborhoods and is one of the greatest assets we have in fulfilling the ambitious goals of the city's housing plan. As you all know, more than four years ago, which is amazing, it's more than four years ago now, we laid out an aggressive plan with Housing New York in terms of our housing production targets and in terms of the mix of innovative policies and broad strategies that we believed would set the stage for greater affordability for really generations of New Yorkers. We started thinking generationally about this. It's easy to forget the plot a little bit, but we started with the principle that developers had to build more affordable housing to get benefits across a range of incentives. At the time, people talked about the double dip or the triple dip, um, what developers were getting out of it, the, the, the public benefit versus the private benefit that was coming out of developing affordable housing um, in New York City. Um, and we did that from revised program terms and term sheets and subsidies to tax incentives to inclusionary housing. Some of it required time, and it was a legislative agenda that we moved aggressively forward on. And we did something that government doesn't always do, but we did it uh, for very important reasons. We strategically misaligned the terms. We strategically misaligned the incentives so that developers couldn't count all the same affordable units under various incentive programs. And these were reforms that many of you in this room had called on for, for years, sometimes for decades. And so I'm proud of what we've been able to achieve together in partnership to date. We financed the creation and preservation of nearly 90,000 units of affordable housing, and we're on track to reaching our accelerated target of 300,000 units by 2026. And I want to say kind of as importantly, you know, we talk kind of politically and mayors talk about housing plans and units in a plan. One of the ways we've also started thinking about this is how many units does New York City need on an ongoing basis, almost as a replacement rate? So we looked in the previous plan, 15,000 units a year. We cranked it up to 20,000 units a year. We demonstrated that you could do that with the resources and the staff and the money and the people. Um, and now we're up to, we're, we're moving to 25,000 units a year. So while we talk about this overall plan, we're also thinking about what that is and what that means in terms of economic development and jobs and communities and neighborhoods and what the city really needs. And the housing plan though, and we say this all the time because we really do mean it, it's more than just numbers. It's about the people that we house and the communities that we serve. But the reason that we talk about the numbers is because we all know that what gets measured gets done, right? That's a very important thing, that it's a way of measuring it and holding us to some sort of accountability and, and seeing what we're actually getting done. We're also making sure that we reach more of the lowest income New Yorkers. A full third of our plan is dedicated to that production to date. While serving people along a range of incomes from our senior population and families in shelter to those moderate and middle income New Yorkers who find it increasingly difficult to make it in the city. We're also combating displacement in our neighborhoods on multiple fronts 
adding more permanent affordability, which is something I bring up every, every time I speak, into our housing with tools like mandatory inclusionary housing. Mandatory inclusionary housing really, really is a game changer. And you can think about it as you can call it community equity, you can call it neighborhood equity. This is something that folks called on for years. When you, when you had this discussion five or 10 years ago, people talked about affordable to who and for how long, right? But for the, so for the first time, really the people of the city of New York are partners in these projects. That housing becomes a resource, not just for 30 years or 60 years or 90 years, but permanently. And you know, we've been tracking this because we talked about how many units were gonna come out of this plan when we did the plan. Whether you look at certification or pre-certification, where we are, what's in the pipeline, we're at over 8,000 units that are coming through the MIH program on the permanently affordable piece of that. And every week when I'm in our credit committee, I see projects that come through with a share that is now permanently affordable. And it's really an impressive, impressive thing to see. I was out at a groundbreaking a couple weeks ago where 500 units in this groundbreaking and close to half of them were permanently and sustainably affordable and will be a resource for that community permanently. Um, and it impacts all zonings in the city. Everyone wants to talk about the, the, the public rezonings, but it's all of the private applications across the city as well, and I think that's very important to focus on. We're also taking a holistic approach to neighborhood revitalization with those comprehensive rezonings, coupled with increased engagement and coordinated investment to ensure that we're responding to the evolving and varied needs of each neighborhood, and that the people can afford to stay in the neighborhoods that they help to build. And we're working to foster even greater partnership with nonprofit organizations through initiatives like neighborhood, the Neighborhood Pillars Program and new models like Joe New York City, the joint operating entity of New York City, which bring increased financial resources, but also creativity, innovation, and efficiency to our collective work. I wanna pause for a minute on a broader, but a related idea that there are social and institutional forces that are not always formally or fully recognized and celebrated. Lately, a familiar one is the free press, the importance of real journalism, but it is really much, much more. And I think that our nonprofits can be thought of in this same light, what's sometimes called the fourth estate or the commons or our, our common cause. And it's in challenging times like these, and we are no doubt in challenging times, that we realize again the importance of these institutions that hold our highest values and really act as a public trust. And that's what our nonprofit sector really should be and can be. Long after the financing is complete, the buildings are constructed and families move into their new homes, it's organizations like yours that remain on the ground each day ensuring our communities have the ongoing support they need to thrive. On a personal note, let me add in this room that I am really with you. I stand with you. Um, it's not something I'll talk about that often because it's, pretty, it's still pretty sacred even a couple decades later. But years ago, I ran uh, service and advocacy programs for one of the earliest HIV and AIDS uh, nonprofits. And for a generation of gay men, and for many women of all persuasions, and many people of all colors and all creeds in the 1980s and the 1990s, service work and not-for-profit work really was our Peace Corps. It was a moral and an ethical calling, and as something you can all relate to, no one else was doing it. So I'm proud to call so many of you in this room a partner in our shared mission. We've accomplished so much together, but it's imperative that we strive to do even more to ensure New York City continues to be a city for everyone. Thank you very much.